I wanted to talk about Baby Reindeer, which is on Netflix all over the world. So I recommend you see it if you haven't yet. I think it's excellent. It's based on a real life story and Richard Gadd, who is the writer, plays himself. This character whose name in the series is Donnie is stalked by someone called Martha. Since making this video, I've watched the interview between Piers Morgan and the lady that Martha from Baby Reindeer is supposed to represent. And I found that there are things that Piers Morgan says that feel very relevant to this. He questions whether Richard Gadd is a reliable witness and whether we can trust what he says happens. And the reasons he gives are pretty horrendous. One of them is that he was having sex with someone who was trans. Another one is that he was having sex with someone who was a man. Another one was that he was doing drugs, although he didn't even talk about which drugs he was doing and when exactly, and whether that's really going to mean he doesn't know what on earth is going on every day in his life. But worst of all, well, maybe it's not worst of all, I guess worst of all from where I'm coming from, uh, educating people about abuse, he was saying that the fact that Richard Gadd admitted to masturbating over a picture of his stalker meant that we just can't trust him. You'd have to be either a liar or deluded. And these things are not evidence he's a liar, so I think Piers Morgan is saying he's deluded. So according to Piers Morgan, you can't be abused by someone, or in this case stalked by someone, and also have some sexual attraction to them. And you can't be abused by someone and need them in some way at the same time. And I think that this is so harmful to be getting this out to the general public, let alone all of his homophobia. Worst of all, the psychiatrist who's later on a panel with him discussing this interview doesn't disagree with him. He actually says that Richard Gadd, because of his own issues, is not a reliable witness. And he also talks about the drugs that Richard Gadd was taking. Now, if you're taking hallucinogenics, it might be difficult to talk accurately about what really happened during the period of time you were actually on the hallucinogenics. But that's not what the story is about. Richard Gadd didn't go to work every day on hallucinogenics. You know, he hasn't been on them nonstop and imagined everything that's happened to him. So it's ludicrous to suggest that, and even more ludicrous to not even talk about what drugs he was on. It was just any drug and therefore he must be deluded. And in this video, I'm gonna be looking at how layered abusive situations are. She apparently left him 350 hours worth of voice messages, 47,071 emails. And not only that, but it seems that the messages we see throughout the series, at least some of them are based word for word on real messages she left him on his social media profiles. And he's been getting some bad press for this. There have been articles calling him irresponsible for putting out um, this series and for saying that it's based on real life and for using real quotes and so on. Despite that issue, which is, I guess, potentially quite a big one, the series is very powerful. And the reason why is because of the in-depth look it takes at abuse. So often if we, if we see something on TV where abuse is featured, you have the perpetrator who's the baddie and you have the victim who's the goodie and it's all very clear cut. In this series, he talks about how much empathy he has for his stalker. You say this woman is stalking you? Yeah, like six months maybe. Why did it take you so long to report it? I think she needs help. She comes to my work. Richard's character, Donnie, offers Martha a cup of tea and he doesn't charge her for it, even though he's working in a pub. And so he's already coming from this place of feeling like he needs to take care of her. That's the thing I've always wondered, really. Why people meet? Why people fall in love? 
And in that mindset, he isn't able to protect himself from her. And this is so common with abusive situations. You know, even now when he talks about her, he doesn't talk about her, when I mean her, I mean his real life stalker. He doesn't talk about her with anger or disgust. He talks about someone he feels for, you know, he really empathizes with. That brings me to the baby reindeer thing. As I think you're probably wondering. Basically, I had this wee cuddly toy when I was young. Went with me everywhere. Earliest memory I have, I think, was Christmas time. This old photo of me sitting with this paper hat on my head and this baby reindeer beside me. Anyway, this reindeer was this cuddly, fluffy thing. And he sees the similarities between his own insecurities and her, and his own sadness and hers, you know, and his own loneliness and hers. It was the only good thing about my childhood. I'd hug it when they fought. And they fought a lot, you know. Well, you are the spit of that reindeer. And so that relating to his abuser means that he can't get into the mindset of being able to protect himself from her. And this happens all the time. And yet we don't hear about it on TV, you know, or on in movies. It's almost as if people are so afraid of victim blaming that they have to make sure the perpetrator is totally horrible you know and that the the victim couldn't have done anything to have escaped them so we often see true crime stories and you know where the victim is somebody who was desperately trying to escape their attacker or um, you know they had no choice they were murdered they were raped by a horrible stranger so you're a comedian so it's not going well so is that a question somebody hurt you didn't they who was it? We don't tend to get any insight into a bigger picture. And so I think this is really valuable. I don't know how often this would really apply to this particular situation where someone's being stalked. It's not something that I've come across before with my clients, you know, that they haven't ever been stalked and on the one hand had horrible feelings about it and then on the other hand had some good feelings about it, had some feeling that they needed their stalker. So I think that actually that particular scenario is very unusual. But when it comes to abusive relationships in general, it's very common for the victim of the abuse to believe they have some need for the perpetrator, you know, for that person to be in their life. There's a reason you're keeping her around and maybe it's what she gives to you. Got really manly hands, haven't you? Chiseled jawline. And for that reason, it's, they don't leave, you know, they don't just decide, wow, this is abuse, I'm off. It's not just that the perpetrator can love bomb and, and make them feel really special and then take it all back and abuse them. That's a, a reality, you know, and it's a really important reality. And I've looked at it lots of times in my videos, but there's more to it. There's also the maternal or the paternal instinct of the victim towards their abuser. You know, the, the child, the inner child that they can see who hasn't developed. Um, who they want to nurture and look after, that can stop them from protecting themselves. And that's something I talk about all the time when I'm working with people on boundaries, that you can't set boundaries properly and you can't look after yourself if you're focused on empathizing with somebody else, with the very person that you need to protect yourself from. You simply can't, your focus has to be on yourself and on your safety, whether that's emotional safety or physical safety as well. And that relating to, that goes beyond just empathizing with somebody because you think, um, you know, that they need nurturing. The more you relate to them, the more you might feel validated in some way. 
And so the more you might feel that you need them, and there might be a lot of things about them that you don't relate to. Martha, can you let go of my hand now, please? Martha, please let go! Don't you dare! But if there are some things that feel like you feel inside and you want to connect with somebody on that level, then you can feel like you need to connect with that person and that they get you in a way other people won't. And that keeps you there. That keeps you stuck in that relationship. At one point, Martha talks about how she wants to be inside Donnie. She wants to literally be completely consumed by him. Her behaviour does seem to align with the traits of borderline personality disorder. While he may not have that, he goes to her for validation and he goes to her for this unique um, set of experiences that has given them feelings that they have in common with each other. You know, a, a sense of being alone in the world and isolated and sort of an outsider looking in that they both have. And while he hates being stalked by her, there's one occasion where he actually goes to find her and has sex with her. So there's this strange mixture of being repulsed and being um, horrified every time she shows up, this horrible dread feeling that comes with being stalked. And then on the other hand, there's a need to be close and intimate with her. And while, again, you know, that's not something that I've ever heard of before when it comes to stalking, there is that in abusive relationships, you know, it, the ones that go on, ones where you have a cycle of abuse and then love bombing and then abuse and love bombing. And it's not all because the, the abuser is inflicting all this stuff onto their victim. The, the person who gets abused is playing a role in that as well because their childhood is playing out again throughout the relationship. So in other words, they're looking for a connection that they once had when they were a child that wasn't actually a satisfactory connection. Maybe it was from a mother or father who was neglectful and quite probably abusive. And so that person also had the same kinds of insecurities as they grew up with. And so there's a similar kind of understanding that they have, even though they both end up mostly playing such different roles. And when you have these threads in common with the person who's abusing you, and when you have this belief that you need them, you need to connect with them, then things become complicated. And it turns out that the power won't always be theirs, you know? And so for that reason, somebody who is abused can become an abuser at times. You know, you might find that if you've been in an abusive relationship, there have been times when you've held on to some power and the only way you knew how to was to punish that person and maybe to be cold, maybe even cruel to them at times. And so then the water becomes a bit murky and then you start to feel, well, I know that I've been abusive. So what does that mean? Or even if you haven't been abusive, maybe you've behaved in a confusing way. You know, maybe you've at some points been um, wanting to get really close to this person. And then when they finally start behaving, you're pushing them away because you realize how much you don't trust them because of all the abuse. But these mixed messages are confusing them as well. Should we run away together? And so you know, well, I haven't been this perfect person in this relationship. And so that can lead to guilt. It can trigger all of these messages from childhood that the abuse is your fault. You know, and if you're completely honest, who is going to be on your side? You know, because what about the things you've done? She comes to my work, my house. She sends me emails, like, all the time. Are any threatening towards you? Yeah. 
I wouldn't say that's particularly threatening. That reminds me of all the people who don't understand abusive relationships, you know, because so many little things happen that create a pattern. And one of those little things alone isn't always enough for people to think, oh, well, the relationship should end then. Just like when Donnie shows the policeman the text message, well, it seems completely harmless. And if he'd said, yeah, well, she, she turned up to the show, she started heckling, that's still within the realms of normality. And so when does the person officially cross that line where their behaviour is inexcusable? It often happens in the end in abusive relationships because things don't get better. They tend to get worse and worse and worse. But by that time, it can be very hard and people can start lying about what's really going on because they know that everybody is going to tell them to leave that person. But what's difficult is that they've got to that place in the first place because before, when they did talk about what was going on in the relationship, people would excuse that behaviour. That's something that happens all the time. You know, people hear about abusive behaviour and they say, oh, maybe they had a hard week. You know, you told me they were stressed at work. Maybe it was this, maybe it was that. Maybe you could just have a conversation about it. It's just all about communication, you know. And, and, and they don't realise that all of these different things that are going on in the relationship constitute a pattern which is abuse. It reminds me also of what we're talking about on the course at the moment. And if you haven't joined the course yet, this is a perfect time to join it because we're talking about core beliefs. And you can watch the recording of that class and bring any questions you have to the next Q&A. While we've been talking about core beliefs, we've had to go through people's negative thoughts about themselves and what they consider to be evidence um, that backs up those beliefs as being true. Sometimes people feel concerned because they think, well, some of this really is evidence that I behave badly. You know, some of this is evidence that I'm selfish or, or lazy or whatever this belief is. And the reality is that nobody is perfect. And I think one part of leaving a relationship, one really important part of leaving an abusive relationship and of healing from abusive relationships is coming to terms with the fact that you yourself are not perfect, that you have made mistakes and you have been responsible for staying in the relationship as long as you did. That doesn't mean that you have to beat yourself up and hate yourself for it because we are all human, you know? So there isn't actually such a thing, unless someone's walking through the park and, and a stranger attacks them. In most cases, a victim is somebody who has been in a relationship with their abuser and has chosen not to leave when they've had multiple opportunities to do that. And that's because of relating to the perpetrator, of empathising with the perpetrator, of believing that they need something from the perpetrator. And, um, and sometimes it's because of the way they have treated the perpetrator that makes them feel like they're no longer allowed to protect themselves because they've been unfair or they've been nasty or they've been cold or confusing themselves. And so therefore, they are now in the same category as the abuser. So it's really important to see grey areas when it comes to these situations. And that's what this series is all about. It's all about understanding that these are two humans, you know, and and how, and that's the problem. Because if, if, if abusers were just dark, nasty characters, nobody would fall in love with them and nobody would need anything from them and nobody would you know give them the time of day and so they wouldn't be abused in the first place and the other thing that's important to understand is that if you've been in an abusive relationship your childhood has played a part the abuser didn't have as much power as you might have attributed to them you know, a lot of this will have been your past playing out and you therefore accepting behaviour that 
isn't good for you. You know, and believing that you need to be in that situation because it feels so familiar and so similar to the situation you were in as a child. And, and deep down, somewhere in your unconscious mind, you're telling yourself that if you can only connect with this person, then you can fix everything that happened when you were a child. And it wasn't about you after all. You know, if you can get this person to love you consistently, then you are worthy and you do matter. And of course, in reality, that's got nothing to do with this person. So there are different parts to you. There's the part that wants to get away from this person, the part of you that knows that you can't trust them. They've done all these awful things. And then there's the part of you that desperately wants to get that connection with them that you don't quite have yet, you know, and that, that thinks that all the other stuff can go away if you can only form that connection. And that is not all about the abuser. It's not all about the abuser love bombing you and then turning on you and abusing you and about all the confusion in your mind that comes as a result of that. That is, it's important to understand that that happens, but that's not the whole story. And there are many people on the internet, you know, on YouTube and so on, who who paint the abuser as being the one with all the power, who's doing, who's manipulating you so much that you literally haven't got any choice at all. I did a video myself talking about how strong the compulsion can be to wait for the love bombing again. You know, experiments they've done on rats who, you know, keep pressing a lever to get food, even though Half of the time they're not getting food when they press the lever, they're getting something unpleasant happening. So that's real, you know, it is real, but our brains are so powerful. You know, we're so capable as humans, when we really want something, we're able to break away and to free ourselves. And so if you believe that you can't because you're trapped because of this other person and this magic they've performed on you, then you're not allowing yourself to be fully empowered. And, and that's not just about a current relationship, that's also about a past relationship. If you feel like, no, I can't see the wood for the trees and it's because of the way they were so inconsistent, then you're ignoring, or at least you're partly ignoring the part you've played, you know, in projecting onto them, in trying to get what you needed from your childhood that you didn't get from them, you know, everything that you believe that you need from them and all the ways in which you relate to them, you're ignoring all of that and that's taking away from your power because the more you recognize this stuff, the more you're able to address it and do something about it and realize that you're a separate person, you know, and you don't need anybody who treats you badly, no matter how nice they can be at other times, you know, you just don't need that. You don't need anything from them. So I hope that was helpful. I think I got quite passionate about that because I think it's just a really important point to, and, and I think that this series, if you haven't seen it, go and watch it because this series, I think, really spells it out so clearly. And I think many people who watch it will relate to it. So um, I hope that helps. If you're recovering from narcissistic abuse, then you might be interested in one of my courses. My website is www.sanitysave.com. So have a look at that and see if that might benefit you. Look after yourselves and um, I'll see you in the next video. Oh, and if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Um, he was stalked by somebody who's... <laughs> Danny, you mustn't keep talking. He was stalked by someone whose name... <laughs> She's competing for airtime. Yes, darling. Yes, Amelia. I can hear you, darling. You sound very croaky. Mm-hmm. Yes. Can I carry on talking? Will you let me?